It's in Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. When I finish reading, I'll say this is the word of the Lord. You guys can respond with, thanks be to God. So starting in verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son, and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there was a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to New King. We're thrilled that you're here today. This is an interesting parable. Oh, yes, if anybody uh, doesn't have a Bible, Celestin is in the back. Put your hand up. We'll give you a Bible. I'm going to turn to a whole bunch of verses today in this one section in Matthew, and it might be helpful if you had a Bible. So if you want one, she will deliver you one. Young lady down in the front here, in the front, yes? <laughs> she doesn't have a Bible? Ben, get her a Bible. <laughs> All right. So what do you think of this parable, if you heard it read? Um, maybe you're not so glad to be here when you hear this parable about this, about this king that gets so mad that he goes and he, he burns a city and kills everybody in it. You might say, I, I, I don't want a kingdom like that. What about at the end when, when he, he sees this person at the wedding feast without the proper, proper attire? And he gets mad and, and throws this guy into, into utter darkness. If you're a Christian, I bet there's a time in your life when you read this and were like, oh my word, I'm scared. It caused you terror. It caused you to be afraid. I know I've been afraid of that a few times in my life. It's like, oh my, is the Lord going to look down at me one day and say, I never knew you? Depart from me. Ever had those thoughts? Well, today, what I hope to do is look at this parable in context and show you a couple of things about it. So let's pray, and then we'll jump right into it. Uh, Father God, help us this morning to understand this parable. Father, help me by your Holy Spirit to speak clearly, to not be nervous, but to speak and teach the word of God to the glory of Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as many of you know, um, my career in the secular world was in aerospace. I was a systems engineer. And what a systems engineer does for a living is he looks at the bigger parts of the airplane and designs them, whole systems that do things. And almost every engineer um, loves to go down into the detail. And that's a really good thing if you're flying an aircraft. You want to make sure that someone's in the detail. But part of my job was to help people to lift up their heads and see the bigger picture. For, for instance, we used to design systems for uh, landing gear, to, to extend landing gear and to retract landing gear, and people would be down in the details, and I would always bring them back and say, do you remember what we do? Do you remember why it's important? 
and people's eyes would open up. So, oh yeah, we do that on the airplane. That's really cool. What I am going to attempt today is something that no man has ever done before in the history of the New Testament. I am going to attempt to give you an overview of a couple of chapters so that you understand the context. You understand the big picture. The details are important, and I'm going to show you some details. But what I'm going to do is weave together for you a tapestry of Scripture, and you're going to see the threads and how they connect in a way that you may not have seen before. And the whole purpose of it will help you understand what this parable is about. So that's what I'm going to attempt. Are you with me on that? Will you help me? Will you stay awake? Will you, will you follow along? Will you not go to sleep, Ben? I mean, he's usually right out. I mean, he's just out. Yeah, I know, right? He's, he's old and he's tired and he's sick. So here's what we're going to do. If you have a Bible, turn over to, to Matthew's Gospel, the very beginning, chapter 21. And that begins a whole new section in Matthew. It's called the triumphal entry. Jesus comes in. Where does he come into? He comes into Jerusalem. He comes up to the Temple Mount. And, and what happens in those first 11 verses, if you notice, if you have an ESV, that's the subject of the first uh, uh, 11 verses, the triumphal entry, where Jesus comes in. And I want to just point out two things about that that are significant to, to, to my talk here this morning. Two things. The crowds shout. You remember? The crowds shout, Hosanna. Hosanna, it says, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, Hosanna means save us. Save us, O son of David. Save us, O son of David. And it's a quote from Psalm 118. Save us. So notice that. They cry that out. And then, as things progress, um, th th um, the whole city was stirred up, it says in verse 10. Who, who is this guy? Who is this? And the crowds respond. And what do they call Jesus? A prophet. Did you ever notice that before? This is the prophet Jesus from Galilee, from Nazareth. A prophet. So, so Jesus comes, and they say, this is the prophet. What I want to show, the, show you this morning is Jesus comes throughout this whole section in the character of a prophet. Now, what does a prophet do? What does a prophet do for a living? What's his job description? We often immediately say, oh, he tells the future. A prophet prophesies, he tells the future. Not quite right. Yes, that's part of it. The main role of a prophet is to call out the heart of God's people. To call them out. When you read Isaiah, the first thing Isaiah does is call out the heart of God's people. When you read Jeremiah, the first thing you read is he calls out the heart. The people are far from God. And he calls out their heart and he says to them, repent, turn back. Turn back to God's ways or the future comes. And it's not pretty. That's what all the prophets do. They call out the heart of God's people. They call them out to repent. And then they give them a warning that says, if you don't repent, judgment is coming. That's a prophet. Jesus comes in the character of a prophet. Who is this? It's the prophet Jesus. Okay, you with me on that? You see that, right? The next section. 12 through 17, Jesus cleanses the temple. He cleanses the temple. And uh, we, we read that last week, and Ben preached on that a little bit. I had a great sermon about that. And uh, I want to point out just a couple of things. Um, he throws out the money changers. Verse 13, uh, he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Then of robbers. Now, when I think of a robber, when I said this in the first service, I don't think anybody got it because no one's as old as me. But when I think of a robber, I think of the old Batman series 
way back when. And there was always a guy in a leotard with a mask on. He had a little cap on his head, and he had a bag with money. He stole the money, and he was running around. I always think of that. That's what comes to mind when I think robber. That's not what this is. That's not what this is at all. In fact, the Greek word means someone who is an insurrectionist. An insurrection. What's an insurrectionist? An insurrectionist is a person that is a mutineer, an insurgent, someone taking part in the overthrow of authority. And Jesus says, you've made this holy place a den of robbers, a den for robbers. So what does that mean? This comes, as Ben taught us last week, from Isaiah chapter 7. And Isaiah is, guess what? A prophet. You guys all got it. Very good. You're paying attention. A prophet. And back in that chapter, which Isaiah 7 it starts out, and it says to the religious leaders, God says to the religious leaders, you cry out, the temple, the temple, the temple. And then you go and you do whatever you want. You'll go against my laws, you have idols, you, you, you spiritual adulterers is what you are. And then you come running back to the temple and say, oh, we have the temple, we're, we're covered, we're set, that's our refuge. We go into God's house and everything's good, but we do what we want. Keep that in mind, a den of robbers. That's the first thing. And how does Jesus cleanse the temple? Yeah, he throws out the money changers. But also notice the second part of his cleansing. Verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. See, the blind and the lame were not allowed to come into God's presence. They didn't measure up. They were the outcasts. They were the ones that were outside. And what does Jesus do? He cleanses them. And now they have access into the very presence of God in a way they never had before. Do you think that might be significant in where this story is going? Just, just think about that. Third thing. The religious leaders are indignant. Notice what it says in verse uh, 15. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out of the temple, quoting from Isaiah, Hosanna to the son of, the, of David, they were indignant. They were mad. They were angry. They didn't like it. There was this feeling of, who does he think he is? This is our den. This is our man cave. This is where we hang out. What is he doing bringing those people in here? They were indignant. See the picture. In the morning, the next section, verse 18, Jesus curses the fig tree. And that's a really weird section. He comes upon, upon this fig tree, and it's all leaves all over it. And Jesus looks for fruit, and there is none. There's only leaves. And the next thing you know, it's withered up, and it's dead. What on earth is that about? How does that fit in here at all? Verse 19, seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered up at once. He looked for something, fruit, it wasn't there, and judgment came. Yeah, he judged the fig tree. And then what happens? Then Jesus goes off into this almost completely different subject. He starts talking about mountains and prayer and mountains being thrown into the sea. But is it mountains he's talking about or is it a mountain? So when you read it, Jesus responds to all this, and they, the disciples say, what's up with the fig tree? What are you doing here? Verse 21, Jesus answered them, and truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to 
this mountain. This mountain. If you taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And that talks about prayer and faith. What's Jesus getting at here? This mountain. This holy mountain. This temple mountain will be judged. And do you know that that's what the next three or four chapters are all about? The judgment against the Jewish leaders and the Temple Mountain itself. Not many years after, the Roman general Titus will come marching into Jerusalem and attack the city and overrun it and burn it to the ground. This mountain will be cast into the sea. And what does the sea mean? What does Jesus mean by the sea? Why the sea? If you're an Old Testament scholar and you read your Bibles, you will find that in the Old Testament, the sea stands for two things. Chaos and the nations. So chaos. You often see the, the, the Israeli people, the Jewish people, they were not mariners, really. They didn't like the water. They, they, they didn't really like it. And it was something that was chaotic and something to be afraid of. And they talked about the monsters of the deep, Leviathan, and all this stuff comes out. Rahab, the monster. So it was something that was very chaotic and something to be, to be afraid of. But it also meant the nations. The sea almost, almost always means the nations as well. So things in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, will be cast into the sea. Their Jewish faith, the way that they practiced it, would be cast out. And God is then going to go to the nations. Do you see that little hint there? And it's going to come out more and more as we go along. Jesus is just hinting at these things. But when we read it in context, we start to see it. So the fig tree. Now the next section, the authority of Jesus is challenged. Verse 23 through 27. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came up to him as he was teaching and said, who do you think you are? By what authority do you teach? By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Who do you think you are taking over our den, walking in on us and telling us and doing things? Who are you? Where do you get your authority? And what does Jesus reply? John the Baptist. He starts talking about John the Baptist. Jesus answered them, verse 24, I will ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I'll tell you by what authority. The baptism of John, where did it come from? So he starts talking about the baptism. Why? Why the baptism of John? What on earth could Jesus be talking about? Why didn't he talk about Isaiah? Why didn't he talk about Jeremiah? Why didn't he talk about Ezekiel? Why didn't he talk about Daniel? Why John the Baptist? So as good Bible scholars, you immediately say, let me go back and have a quick look at the baptism of John and see if I can get a hint about why Jesus brings up this. So hold your finger there and go back to Matthew chapter 3, where we have John the baptizer baptizing in the wilderness. John chapter 3, verse 7. John was down in the Jordan and in, in, in baptizing people. Verse 7, And when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, Sadducees coming to his baptism, so it's the religious leaders again. It's the same group of people, the exact same group of people. And what does John the Baptist say to these religious leaders when they come? Oh, come on in, the water's nice. Let me, have, let me get you a cappuccino and I'll get you a nice towel. No. He says to them, You brood of vipers, doesn't it? Did you read it there? 3, 7, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, from the judgment to come. That's a hint to us. Who warned, same people that Jesus is talking to, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Down in verse 10, even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit, it's a fig tree. I remember that. Wait a minute. There's a connection here. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Do you see now why Jesus went back to John the Baptist? It fits the situation exactly. I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. That's Jesus. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand. He will clear the threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is all judgment. Unless you repent and have the fruit of repentance, the fire comes. Do you see why Jesus refers to the baptism of John? And then what happens? By what authority does Jesus have? What, who gives him the authority? And we read the next section in Matthew 3. What happens? Jesus is baptized. And the voice of the Father comes from heaven. This is my son. In whom I am well. Where does Jesus' authority come from? It comes from the Father. So we did answer the question. It's right there if we only had the eyes to see. Okay, now back in Matthew uh, 21. So, so talking about, uh, talking about the, uh, why Jesus referred to John the Baptist, talks about it. It fits in with this section. And then Jesus responds to their question about authority. They can't answer him, so he says, all right, I'm going to tell you three parables. These three parables all come boom, 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 bang, 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 one after the other, one, two, three. We tend to read them in isolation. We tend to take them out of context. The context is Jesus is speaking to the same people in all three, the religious leaders of the day, at the same place, at the same time, with the same topic. And I'm going to prove that to you. So the first parable that Jesus tells them is about a father who sends two sons off to do some work for him. And what do we have? We immediately have insurrection against the father. The two don't want to do it. And the next parable talks about the master of a vineyard. And there's insurrection against the master. And the third parable. Why, we know the third parable. We just read it. Insurrection against the king. So they intensify. They ratchet up. And Jesus, remember who he's speaking to specifically. He is on the Temple Mount. They've asked, who do you think you are? And Jesus now says, Here's three parables to show you who you are. Yeah. <laughs> Sylvia, you got it. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Okay, so parable number one, the parable of the two sons. Just have it, we'll just have a quick look at it. Uh, it's uh, 20, 28 through um, 32. Jesus responds to them. What do you think? He's, he's this conversation, there's no break here. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son says, I will not. Insurrection. Won't submit. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. Second son. He went to the other son. Said the same thing. And the second son said, I will go. But he didn't. Insurrection. So Jesus says to the religious leaders, who did the will of the Father? And they know the answer. Uh, the first guy. Jesus said, you're right. Truly, I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. Huh. For John came to you. There's John again. Remember John the Baptist? It's all about making the connection. 
John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe. What is this first parable about? If you could sum it up in one word, what would it be? Repentance. It's about changing your mind. It's about seeing something and turning and changing your mind. It's all about repentance. What did John the Baptist do? He preached repentance. This first parable is about repentance, if you could sum it up in one word. Parable number two. The second parable. Here another parable, he says. Continues on the discussion. There's no break here. Same people, same situation, same topic. Here another parable. I'm going to show you who you are even more. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. This is almost a direct quote from the great prophet Isaiah, chapter 5. So again, Jesus is acting in the character of a prophet, and he quotes a prophet. He quotes Isaiah. Remember, Isaiah was a prophet. He called out the hearts of the people, wanted them to turn back. Jesus now, in the same character, uses a story in Isaiah to call the people back. And what happens? Verse 34. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get the fruit. So here we go. We're continuing this idea of fruit. There's a theme here. And what happened? The tenants, verse 35, took his servants and beat one and killed another one. And stoned another one. Can you imagine? It's turned violent very quickly. Some scholars say this is a picture of how the Old Testament prophets were treated. They were killed. They were stoned. They were beaten. They were sawn asunder. The messages of God were treated terribly. So some people say this, this is Jesus telling a parable about the history of the Old Testament. But the master persists. Again, verse 36, he sent other servants more than the first, and they did the same. What is this master to do? What can I do? I know what I'll do. I'll send my son. They'll respect my son. My son comes in my name. He represents me. And what do they do? They kill him. Now, you know what that speaks of. I don't have to tell you. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. What should the master of the vineyard do, Jesus asks. This reminds us of another story in the Old Testament. Do you remember David, King David? David committed murder and adultery. And what did God do? He sent Nathan the prophet to David. And Nathan the prophet comes in and he says, King David, let me tell you a little parable about a man with a little lamb. Remember that story? Jesus comes as a prophet here too and tells a little parable. And then at the end of it, the little lamb is taken from this man. And Nathan says to David, what should happen? And David says, give me this man, string him up, off with his head. And what happens here? The exact same thing. Jesus comes in the character of Nathan the prophet, tells a parable to speak to their heart, and they don't quite get it yet. They say, off with his head. 
Verse 41, he will put those wretches to a miserable death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him fruits in their seasons. And what does Jesus say? <laughs> Remember what Nathan said back in the Old Testament? You are the man, O King David. And David's heart was cut to the quick, and he fell down prostrate. Jesus said to them, have you never read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruits. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces when it falls on him, it will crush him. Judgment. What is this parable about? If you could sum it up in one word, if the first was repentance, the second parable is fruit. What did John the Baptist preach? Repentance and the fruit that accompanies it, co accompanies it. What are these first two parables about? Repentance and fruit. Do you see the connection? Do you see the threads here that are being laid out by Matthew? They all connect. And now we finally, at long last, come to the parable we have before us today the parable of the king that throws a wedding banquet for his son. After that, this whole thing continues. Jesus deals with three questions that were pertinent to the day. What should we do about an intolerable government that makes us pay taxes that we can't pay? What, what, do, we do, what do we do about, about the future, the resurrection? What do we do about, about God's word and the law? How do we deal with that? Jesus answers all three. And then chapter 23 comes up. And in the character of a prophet, Jesus pronounces seven woes upon the religious leaders. And then you have chapters 24 and 25. What is that about? <laughs> it's Jesus in the character of a prophet predicting the judgment that's going to come on Jerusalem in A.D. 70 when the city will be destroyed and the Lord will come. You see, it all connects in. It's all the same topic, and then it ends, and Jesus comes off the Temple Mount, and it's over. But it's all one story. And you and I miss it when we take a verse or two here and there. Okay, so now we come, finally, yes, truly, to the wedding feast. What is that about? There's three parts. There's the initial invitation, then the replacements are brought in, and then this whole deal about the inappropriate wedding garment. So verses 1 through 7, the initial invitation. And again, Jesus spoke to them, 22 verse 1, in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not so the setting for this parable is a countrywide celebration for the king's son's marriage. People are invited. It is a countrywide celebration that will probably go on for several days, as was the custom back then. And the king has sent out invitations probably to the more prominent people in the area, right? We're going to see that he at first probably didn't invite everybody, but he sent out the invitations. And uh, it says that in verse 2, um, verse 3, he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. So what happened in those days was, was a, 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 an invitation went out, and you knew about it well in advance. And then on the day, the call went out, come now. You've been invited, come. 
Come to my wedding feast. My son is getting married. It is a time of glorious joy and celebration. Come. But they would not. And the king persists once again. Verse 4. He sent other servants saying, tell those that are invited. Explain to them what's here at my wedding feast. See what I have done. See the preparations that I have made. You will have food beyond measure. You will have the best wine. You will have music. <laughs> I have prepared my dinner. My oxen, my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Explain to them. Tell them what it's like. It's a party. Come to the wedding feast. And what happens then? Verse 5, but they paid no attention. Went off. One to his farm, another to his business. I don't have time for this. I've got a life to lead. I've got the internet to search. I don't have time to be coming to these wedding feasts. I'm not coming. But as before, it quickly turns to violence. It's amazing how quickly. Verse 6, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Now, just you have to understand in the culture of the day, you did not refuse the king. This was the king we are talking about. This is the ultimate ruler in that land. And they say, we won't come, and we're going to kill the messenger. This is insurrection to the ultimate authority of the day. What on earth should this king do? How should he respond? And we see it, similar to the previous parable. The king was angry, verse 7. He sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. At this point in time, the Roman troops, they're coming. It'll be a few decades, but they're coming. The city's going to get burned. It's going to happen. And then what happens? The replacements are brought in. The second string, you might say. Verse 8, Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads. Invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall, was filled with guests. The king has his way. The wedding hall is filled. The invitation goes out to others, not to the prominent, not to the leaders, but to the highways, to the roads, to the tax collectors, to the prostitutes, Luke 14 tells a similar story, a similar parable about a great, great banquet. And it says in verse 23, Go out quickly, says the master. Go quickly to the streets, to the lanes of the city. Bring in the poor. Bring in the crippled. Bring in the blind. Bring in the lame. Go to the highways and the hedges. Compel them to come in so my house may be filled. How did Jesus cleanse the temple? He cast out the money changers and he brought in and he healed the poor and the blind and the crippled. Do you see the connection? It all fits here, does it not? The replacements. And so the wedding hall was filled with guests. The king would have it no other way. And then the last part that scares us all to pieces, the inappropriate garment. So what happens at the end? Verse 11, when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man with no wedding garment 
and you said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Years ago, I traveled over to the UK on business uh, to uh, British Aerospace. We were doing a project for them on one of their aircraft. And, uh, you know, over there, back in those days, you wore a suit to all the meetings. You know, a three, not a three-piece suit, maybe a four-piece suit, I don't know. But you had to have the jacket and the tie and the shoes and all that. And that's, that's, that was the expected protocol. That's what you did. So for three or four days, I wore this suit. You know, I felt like I was in my dad's suit. I never felt comfortable in a suit. So I would wear the suit, and then one night, I think it was Thursday night, we decided to take all those guys out for dinner at a fancy restaurant, all these British characters, right? So I am sick of the suit, right? I don't want to look at the suit again. So I show up, I've got a pair of dress pants and a button-down shirt, and it's kind of cold that night, so I've got a jacket on. So I go walking into this fancy restaurant, and I take my jacket off. I swear every head turned and looked at me, like, how did that guy get in here? no jacket. Before I could even say anything, the next thing I knew, there was a man behind me who slipped on this brown tweed jacket. And then I turned and he said, here's a tie. There's, there's a, a, a washroom over there. Go put the tie on and now you can come in. I felt like an idiot, but I accepted it and I went in. So what was happening? What was going on in Jesus' day when the king gave a feast, when a rich person gave a feast, he supplied the garments, little dresses, <laughs> tights. The king, it was his obligation to supply the festive garments for everybody. And what was going on here? A man came in, and there they were at the front, and they had, okay, you're a 34 long, and okay, you're a, you know, a 42 wide, and they gave him garments to wear. And this one guy says, no, I, I, I'm going to come in to the king's house. I'm going to partake of the food. I'm going to eat all the good stuff. I'm going to drink the best wine. I'm going to dance to the music, but you're not telling me what to wear. I'm wearing what I came in, and that better be good enough for that king. That's what's going on. And you and I miss it, because we don't know the culture back then. But there it is. That's the culture. How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. The king said to his attendants, bind him hand and foot, cast him into utter darkness. In that place, there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. So what does the wedding garment stand for? In parables, we, we, we look at it and says, oh yeah, the sower goes out to sow the seed. The seed is the word of God. What does a wedding garment stand for? Do you know? It's been all through what we've read already. You remember the first parable? What did it stand for? One word. Repentance. What did the second sta parable stand for? Fruit. Repentance. And the fruit that's keeping with repentance. So what was this guy that didn't have a wedding garment? He refused to submit. He refused to repent. He had no fruit. So it's the person that says, I will not submit. I want all the good things, but I will not repent. I will not submit. I will not be clothed by the king. And out he goes. So what do we do with all this? How, how do we make sense of it? Okay. Three things to conclude us with. Thing number one. If you're a Christian, this parable shouldn't cause you terror. If you're a Christian, this parable shouldn't cause you terror. It's spoken specifically to the religious leaders, the insurrectionists who use the temple as their shield, their cover, their den. They refuse to accept the authority 
of the Father, parable number one. The Master, parable number two. The King, parable number three. If you're a Christian, if you've repented, if you've turned, you know, repentance is this idea of turning. You turn from your sin. You turn away and say, I turn from that. I leave that. And what do I turn to? I turn to Jesus. I believe that he died for me. I believe that he shed his blood for me. I believe that he took my sins, and they're now as far as the east from with the what from the west, I change my mind. I repent. I turn from one and I embrace the other. And now I'm clothed with the righteousness of Christ. And now I go out in my life and I see my changed life and there's fruit. And what is that fruit? One of the key passages that talks about fruit is about the internal fruit the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, the, the love that we have for each other. Well, our minds are changed. Our hearts are changed. We have a new heart. We have a new way of thinking. If you're a Christian, my word, don't be afraid of this parable. You know what the New Testament tells you? The book of Hebrews, three things about our Christian life and about our salvation. Number one, have boldness. Number two, have confidence. Number three, have a clear conscience. So if you're a Christian and you have repented and given your life to Jesus and you see changes in your life, don't let this parable scare you. It's not about you. However, point two, there is something in Scripture that says that we as Christians should confirm our faith. There's two verses that come to mind. The first is in 2 Corinthians 13. And Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. What does that look like? Have I repented? Have I put my trust in Jesus? Am I trying to live for him. I know I'm not perfect. I know I make my mistakes. I know that I still sin. But I have a conscience now that says, oh, I've sinned against God. I need to repent. That's evidence that you're a Christian. So, so Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. First Peter, or Second Peter chapter 1 says, be diligent to confirm your calling and election. That's Second Peter 1.10. And right before that, Peter gives seven qualities to look at in your life. Read that as a homework assignment. Let's go back, 2 Peter chapter 1. Seven qualities that confirm that you indeed are a Christian. One of them. Let me just give you one of them. Do you love your Christian brothers and sisters? Do you have an affection for them? Do you long for Sunday morning when we can be together for community group? Do you have a desire to be with other Christians? Do you pray for them? Do you think about them? Do you wish the best? That's a sign that you're a Christian. Simple as that. Do you love your brothers and sisters? So these things are very simple, and they go with our nature. Okay. Confirm your faith. Finally, last point. If you're not a Christian, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus, do you know what you're refusing? See, when we read the parable, we, we jump right to the end and we get all nerved up about the weeping and the wailing and the gnashing of teeth and the outer darkness. And we forget, we forget so quickly the setting of the parable and how it begins. My friends, what is the kingdom of heaven like? <laughs> it is like a celebration. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who gave a wedding feast for his son 
God will have a feast. God will have a celebration. God will have a great banquet. That's the best he can describe it. And you are invited. God will send out a thousand servants to invite you to be part of his wedding feast, to invite you to come and partake of it. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what the world today is like. A thousand people, a thousand servants going out to everyone, into the highways and the byways. Notice it said, to the good and the bad, to everybody. It doesn't matter what your, what your situation is, whether you're on top of the world or at the bottom. The call goes out to everybody. You are all invited to the celebration. And what does it look like? God doesn't provide a crust of maggoty bread or a flask of vinegar or some old dirge to sing. Oh, no. Oh, no. He provides the best food. He provides, the, he saves the best wine until the end. He provides music and dancing and celebration and togetherness and joy that goes on and on and on. You see, God wants to take that hunger you have, and he wants to feed you. God wants to take that fiery thirst that's on your tongue and give you clean, cool water to drink. He wants you to come and enjoy his son with him, where there's singing. And there's dancing. I can't dance, but if you're wondering, I can't dance. But I'm going to dance in heaven. I can't sing either, but I, we are going to celebrate for eternity at God's festive celebration with him. That's what you're saying no to. That's what you're refusing. And notice as this parable progresses, judgment is God's strange work, as it says in the Old Testament. God has to be forced into judgment. You see, he persisted and persisted and persisted. He had to force him to act in judgment. He comes in love with invitation to a feast, and we repeatedly insult his offer. We pay no attention. We refuse. We react violently. We mock and we taunt and we break every law and ultimately spit in his face and say, no, I will not wear that garment. I'll come my own way. I'll come. I'll have a little bite to eat. I'll hear the music, but you're not dressing me. I refuse to submit. Will you submit today? Will you repent? Will you trust Jesus as your Savior and come in to the banquet and be clothed, not with your sins, but with his righteousness? You see, the king gave the very best. He held nothing back. And in the end, he says, I'll send my son. I will send him. Will you not accept Jesus as your Savior this morning? Let's pray. Father God, bless this word. Help us have more reverence for you and all that you have done and for your kingdom. Help us to enjoy the feast. Help us to reverence and worship your son. Father, we are thankful for all that you have done for us. I pray this in Jesus' name.